Hey everybody, welcome to another video. So I wanted to take some time to talk about this scripting technique, which I found a little bit interesting. And I'll go over a little bit of an introduction here. So if I were to say that this map is Arabia and I were to ask the question, where is the opponent? I could um, say that I'm on this side of the map. So if I were to just kind of pick the opposite side of the map over here, Let's guess over here. So let's reveal the map. And where I guessed was over here, it looks like where the opponent actually spawned was uh, a little bit off from that. And given that this map is Arabia, it really shouldn't surprise us that much. Sometimes players are directly opposite each other, but there does come with this map a bit of variance in the way players spawn with respect to each other. So if I were to generate another map, only this time the map is Kawasan, and I were to ask the same question, where is the opponent? And I will guess relatively uh, with the same methodology, since I'm on this side of the map, I'll guess that the opponent is over here on the exact opposite side of the map. And I will reveal the map now. And basically where I guessed is pretty much exactly where the opponent is. And if you think about it, that really shouldn't be super surprising either. Due to the fact that we have these neutral pawns in the sides of the map between each of the players, it just is the nature of trying to cram more points onto the same circle radius that each point has less freedom in varying its position relative to the other points in this circle. So from a scripting perspective, it's not uncommon to see these kinds of things where we have some sort of neutral feature in between the players on the same circle radius as the players. And this is done usually by replicating the player land statement. So one set of player lands is comprising the actual player lands where the bases are. And the other set of player lands is a different terrain type that comprises these lakes. And I made a video about this in the past, and you can check that out if you are interested. And expanding on that, player lands aren't limited to being replicated only one time. For example, this map here is Immersion, and this has player lands replicated three times. So one set of player lands is actually comprising the player bases, and then we have one set comprising this set of pools on the same circle radius as the player lands. Then we have a third set comprising the other set of neutral pools to get a total of six points along this circle. And if we were to keep generating this, it's pretty much almost always going to be the case where the players are going to spawn directly opposite from each other because due to the fact that there's so many points on this circle, uh, the individual points have a lot less freedom to spawn in different places. It is good in some ways, like for example it prevents a player from being very close to a lake while the other player is very far from a lake, but at the same time it also kind of takes away from the randomness of random maps in general based on the fact that we don't actually need to scout in order to know where the opponent is, they're pretty much always going to be in the same place, directly on the opposite side of the map. And for me, I don't like removing randomness from maps if it can be preserved while still keeping things competitive. So that is something I would like to explore here. So let's go over to the script, and we can see what's happening here. So we have player lands replicated a couple of times. So this first set of player lands has certain properties, has a certain terrain type, and this is what is comprising the actual player bases here and here. And then we have another set of player lands, which has a different terrain type, DLC New Shallow. Importantly, this one has the land ID specified so it will not spawn player objects. And then this next set is basically the same thing, the same terrain type, which allows us to have one set of player objects per player and 
two sets of neutral lakes per player. So since there are two players in this game, each player land statement is going to create two points along the circle radius that we specified. And I'm going to change that slightly. So we're going to do things one at a time. So I'll preface this by saying this only is really applicable in one versus one situations since in 1v1s there's the fewest amount of points which leaves the most freedom for randomness. So if we go back to the map and we'll say if two player game we'll do something different than what we have now and in all other situations we will have basically this same setup. So instead of this statement which is create player lands, I'll say a generic create land. And this will have largely the same properties as these normal player lands. So we'll have the same terrain type, same zone, same base size, same borders. We'll only take this border fuzziness because we don't expect this to generate in any map size other than tiny. And then to assign it to a player, I'll say assign to player, assign to player one. If I copy this and say place for player two, let's see what happens. I don't believe I have the circle radius specified, so I'll just put that in here. But essentially what we can see is that when we have two points along this circle, uh, that leaves us with the most amount of freedom. So we can see that the positions are fairly random. And then for the next land we will create, we'll take the properties of these uh, pawns. So even though this is supposed to be a neutral area, I can force it to be on the same circle radius as the player lands by also assigning it to a player. So if I do this, we notice that it generated a land that happened to have a town center in it, which is kind of weird, but one thing to know about having neutral player lands is if you want to combine a player assignment and a land ID, the land ID always has to come last. So if I switch this around, and now the player assignment is first and the land ID is last. Now it just generates as a neutral pond instead of having player one's town center in it. And you can kind of see where we're getting at here is that when we create each land individually, we're not fixed to even numbers of player lands. So, so if I have two pawns and two player lands, the map now looks like this. And I'll take a third pond and I will assign it to player two. So now we're in this situation in which the map is no longer effectively mirrored. So if I go in this direction, there's only one pond between me and the opponent. 
And if I go in this direction, there's two pawns between me and the opponent. So strategy-wise, it may be desirable to dock in a pawn which is farther from the opponent. But if I'm starting the game, I don't necessarily know which pawn that's going to be unless I have scouted where my opponent is. So it becomes a bit more interesting in that sense compared to if we were in the situation like this, basically the way the map used to be, it doesn't really matter which pawn I would choose because the map is essentially mirrored. So let's keep generating a couple times. And we can notice something that's kind of repetitive throughout all these generations is if we take the blue player and we go around the map clockwise, it's always going to be the case that there's only one pond between the uh, blue player and the red player. Um, so we keep generating. So we take the blue player, we go clockwise, and there's only one pond in this situation. And that has to do with the fact that when we're in this situation signing to players, all the lands will be generated in the order they are seen. So if we want to add some variance in, we can just put a simple random structure up top here. So let's just start random. Define angle one. Define angle two. So when I do this, what I want to achieve here is that if we're considering that the blue player is player one, I want to have one, two, three points generated for player one in this order, which means neutral land, player land, neutral land. But for player two, I want a 50% chance that the player land would be here or here. So what we have currently is the first three lands here are assigned to player one. The first one is neutral. Second one is player. Uh, third one is neutral again, which is what we wanted. But then for player two's lands, these bottom two, I want a 50% chance that um, the player land will be either one of these. So I will say for this one, if angle one, then this will be the player land. Otherwise, this will be the neutral land. And then basically the same thing here, except for angle two. If angle two is the case, then this land will be the player land. Otherwise, it would be the neutral land. So we'll test both cases here. So 100% chance angle one. We'll take the blue player and we'll go clockwise and we're seeing that this is the case where there's only one pond between blue and red. And if I say, uh, now 100% chance angle two, now we take the blue player, we go clockwise again. And now in this situation, there's the two ponds between red and blue. So it's in this way where we can make the map a little less predictable without really compromising too much on the competitiveness because of these five points on our map they're all fairly equidistant from each other so this is one example and the next example we're going to take a look at is mount kailash so you may recognize this from rms cup um, so the way it's been set up basically from the start, is that we have, in a one versus one situation, we have three sets of player lands, similar to 
uh, the last map we looked at, we have one set of player lands comprising the player bases, and then two additional sets of player lands comprising these little pools with shorefish. And then the nature of this map, with having the circle radius fairly large to avoid this mountain in the middle, and the fact that the mountain obstructs the direct path through the middle uh, of the map from for one player as you get to the opponent, it makes the rush distance rather long and can lead to some pretty passive games in some cases. So when we are modifying this map, that's something I want to keep in mind. So um, let's go up to where, the, where we have the player lands. So this is where the player lands are taking place. So we'll, in a similar way, where if we have a two-player game, we'll create the player lands individually. And then otherwise, in a team game situation, we'll just create the player lands with those uh, generic create player land statements. So we'll say create land. We'll kind of just recreate it the way it is now. So. So this would be one of the ones that actually has the player objects. So we'll say assign to player one. We'll have another set which takes the properties of the uh, neutral pools with shorefish. Make sure the land ID is coming after the player assignment. So we have neutral land, player land, neutral land, all assigned to player one. And then we have the same thing, except these ones are going to be assigned to player two. So essentially we just have the exact same map. So what I want to do next is I want instead of six total points along this radius, I want to increase that to seven points. So we'll create ourselves another neutral land here. Reason being is that in order to take advantage of shorefish, you would probably want to set multiple villagers there. So to push these a little closer to where the players are actually spawning is kind of a, more of an incentive for them to actually go and take it. Now what this also does is it makes it so that the opponents are not necessarily directly opposite from each other. They're fairly close, but we could make this rush distance even more variable if we wanted to. So in a similar way, what I want to have happen is I want to have the first three lands assigned to player one in this order, neutral land, player land, neutral land. But then for these remaining four lands, I want a 25% chance that each of these will be the actual land for player two, which means player two could be here, 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 or here. Now, if it spawns in one of these two lands in the back here, that pretty much doesn't really change the map compared to the way it was. But if the player land spawned here or here, all of a sudden the rush distance becomes a bit shorter and um, changes the game up a little bit. So let's try that. So we have all of these assigned to player one in the correct order. And then for player two's lands, if this is angle one, 
I want this one to be the player land. Otherwise, I want it to be the neutral land. And then the same would go for all of player two's other lands, with the exception of if angle two, three, four. So we'll test all of them individually again. So now we're in the situation where if we take player one and we go clockwise, now there's only one little pond between player one and player two. And the rush distance is a bit short in this situation. We'll do that again. And we basically have the same map, except now player two is over here and the rush distance is quite a bit longer. So now if we take player one and we go clockwise, now there's one, two, three lands before we get to uh, player two. And then finally, if angle four, now there's one, two, three, four neutral lands before we get to player two. And it just kind of makes scouting a little bit more important because you don't necessarily know if you would scout this pond and this pond, which one is actually closer to the opponent unless you've already scouted the map. So I just think this technique is pretty interesting when you're dealing with maps such as these with neutral features on the same radius as player lands. It kind of helps keep the map a little less predictable without compromising too much on the competitiveness. So I think that's all I wanted to talk about here. So thanks everybody for watching and I hope you've learned something.